Chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus of Florida. I get confused. Um, so that was die hard. Uh, we, uh, we are very glad to have you here this evening. I think this is an extremely important process that we're going through because we all know that in order for our republic to continue, we must have informed voters. If we don't have informed voters, we're out of luck. We've all seen how that's been working for us. So thank you for being here. We are going to videotape this, and it will be posted. So I'd appreciate it, once it does get posted, that you send it out to your friends and neighbors and family so that they can see these candidates as well and make an informed decision. Please don't just like the video, pass it on so other people can, can, can take a look at it. Um, we are going to be joined first of all with our prayer and we have Pastor Elwin Jenkins, a wonderful Marine veteran. of the risen Christ, which is like four blocks from here. So if you can please welcome Pastor Jenkins. She says, Pastor, can you keep the prayer short? I say, yes. Good bread, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for allowing us to assemble tonight under the, the banner of the Republican Liberty Caucus. I think you've been hearing some of our prayers based upon what we've seen this week. And God, let us continually stand on truth, stand on righteousness, and lift our eyes to the hills from whence cometh our help. Let us be a light in this nation. Let us be salt. Jesus, that's what you told us to be. Then we are going to continue to love America because you have blessed it. And you're going to continue to bless it. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Now bless this assembly tonight. Bless these candidates. Thank you. As we pray, bless them. Bless this house. And bless America. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
have a mission of training the minds and improving the hearts of young people, preparing them for thoughtful and engaged citizenship. Our students, as they work their way through the grades, study the story of the world, and they cycle through the history of the United States four times. By the time that they get to high school, they're studying the Constitution, they read the entire thing, they yeah. study the <laughs> The writings of Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, the Federalist Papers, the Declaration of Independence, all of those things are things that our students will be familiar with thoroughly by the time that they graduate, and they will be great and virtuous citizens, and that's what we're here to prepare. Thank you. Thank you. This is exactly what we need a whole lot more of. This school is amazing. The people who work here are, are amazing. And again, thank you, Dr. Witham, for having us here this evening. Very, very nice. Wonderful. All right. Um, we do have a couple people in the house I want to make sure we, we uh, recognize. We've got former Councilman Don Redland here somewhere. I don't know where he went to. There he is. Hey, Don. Councilwoman Leanna Cumber, who's with us today, right over here. Thank you for joining us. If I miss anybody, I think we're good. Okay. All right. Huh? Sure. Sure. Oh, are you still on soil water? I didn't think so. <laughs> but for everybody who likes it, Brian Allen is here too. He's a wonderful man. We've got two wonderful candidates here. We've got two Republicans who are running for office to fill the seat that has been vacated by Tommy Lazuri. It's unfortunate the way he had to leave the seat, but at least he left the seat. Sorry if that offends anybody, but time is, it's time to move on. Uh, when you've got somebody who's trying to foster Marxist principles within our city, yeah, we need to get that replaced. And we need to replace them with a Republican. These two gentlemen here tonight are vying to do exactly that. So we have, first here is Mr. Nick Howland. Nick is a businessman, and he is also the executive director for Firewatch, which is a veterans suicide prevention program. So please welcome Nick Howland. Now, who would have ever guessed in a million years that this would happen? I mean, truly. People are looking at it going, huh? But it did. And Howdy is a businessman, has been for his, his, uh, all your life, I think. Since he was eight. Since he was eight. And he's currently the owner of restaurants. He's got three of them here in town called the, uh, the remind me. Jumpin' Jacks. Jumpin Jacks. I can never remember. Jumpin' Jacks House of Food. They make great burgers. They're really good. So please welcome Howdy Russell. And then we are honored this evening to have as our moderator uh, an incredible young man. He is spent a lot of time in the Navy, left as a captain. Before he left, he stopped at the Naval War College for a while and taught classes there in international policies and politics. National War College. What did I say? You said Naval War College. Naval, oh, I'm sorry, the National War College. I apologize. And then he came back to, he came to Florida, ran for Congress. Some of you might remember him from a few years back, but he knows what it's like to be a candidate. So don't try to pull anything, either one of you, on him, because he'll know the difference. <laughs> And he now teaches at a classical academy in Clay County. Please welcome Mr. Ryman Scholl. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate that. Uh, that's right. Uh, good uh, evening. My name is Ryman Schoff, and I am the moderator for this evening. And on behalf of the Liberty Caucus, we are so glad that you're here because an informed electorate is the key to having good government. And looking at the elections that we've had recently, when people get involved, good things happen and places turn red. And we definitely like that for sure. Okay, so let's get started because you're not here for me. You're here for these two candidates. Let's just uh, cover a few rules here. We're going to get into uh, two-minute uh, answers. 
and we're going to do a lightning round with one minute answers. I'll give you a heads up, the candidates, so you know what's coming. The two minutes are coming first. Uh, to let you know when your time is about up, I got this lady right here. When you have 15 seconds left, she's going to give you this signal. And when your time is up, she's going to give you this signal. <laughs> and, if you, and then if you keep talking past that signal, then we're going to give you the shepherd's token you're off this thing. Okay? And to let you know, we did I had two candidates together and we flipped a coin to see who was going to go first and last and so forth. And so um, Nick won the toss and he wants to go last. So we're going to start with uh, Howdy first. And this is two minutes to introduce yourself and explain why you're running for office. You have the floor, sir. Hello there. I'm Howdy Russell. Uh, why am I running for office? Uh, actually, it was tapped on the shoulder by uh, a couple guys who said, uh, Tommy Missouri's seat is vacant. How would you feel about running for office? I said, uh, I, I don't know. Let me think about it. Please let me pray about it. Let me talk to Teresa about it. And uh, did all that and then watched the city council meeting. Have you watched the city council meeting? Uh, and so I watched the city council meeting and uh, let's just advice on this. I'll talk a little bit more about it. But uh, it was... Uh, prompting me along with the voice of the Lord that said, uh, how do you need to run for office? Now, what have I done in Jacksonville? We've been here since 1989, uh, run a few businesses in Jacksonville. Uh, the Loop restaurants back in the heyday, the early 90s, quick stint with Larry's Giant Subs, 20 years with Paul Davis Restoration. Um, I don't know how that jump happened from restaurants to that, but, and then uh, just had to get back to restaurants and after I sold my uh, Paul Davis interest, uh, was an initial investor in Maple Street Biscuit Company. Sold out of that a little early before they made millions of dollars on it. And then, uh, but took my proceeds and started uh, Jumpin' Jack's House of Food. Uh, husband to Teresa, father of three kids, uh, grandfather to four, and uh, I love Jackson. Nick Howland, and can everybody hear me? Is it projecting? Great. Uh, first, I want to thank Karen for setting this up, um, as well as the uh, entire Republican Liberty Caucus. Thank you, and uh, Ryland for, for uh, Ryman, sorry, Ryman, um, for being the moderator. My name is Nick Howland. I'm a Navy veteran, I'm a business executive, I'm a father, I'm a husband, and right now I'm the executive director of the Firewatch, which, as Karen mentioned, is Northeast Florida's fight to end veteran suicide. So I was commissioned in the Navy in 95. Um, I was in from 95 to 99. When I got out, I went into business school and 9-11 happened. And I had a little crisis of purpose. You know, I wanted to go back in, but I had just gotten married. My wife and I talked about it in detail. And I had been planning when I was at business school, maybe I go be a consultant or a banker, and I didn't want to do that now that my nation was going to war. So I went into the defense industry, and I've been in the defense industry for about 20 years. I was brought here by Armor Holdings about 15 years ago. You guys might remember them. They're a big body armor and vehicle armor manufacturer. And I've been in the protective products industry ever since, particularly manufacturing protective products. So I've businesses I've run have made about 50% of all fast jet pilots life rafts that support them in the ejection seat. 75% of every Navy sailor's shipboard life rafts and 100% of every Navy SEAL's special maritime assault suits my businesses have made. So I have a long history um, in business and manufacturing, including having served on the city's, uh, sorry, having served in First Coast Manufacturing Association on the board for four years. So why do I want to run? Well, two reasons really. Jacksonville, I think, is at a critical point in its history. Um, we're growing really fast. Is that the 15 second yeah. mark? Okay, we're growing really fast. Um, we're the, uh, about to surpass a million folks here. We need to bolster our police force and we need to bring jobs uh, for all the residents that are coming down here. Thank you. So now we're going to go to our two minute questions. Nick, you are up first. Okay, so very first question. So let's get started with by, by getting directly to the heart of what Republican voters want to know. When we elect people to office, we elect them expecting they will use core conservative principles to make appropriate decisions in running the government. Yet more and more often, our elected officials 
seem to change in office and abandon those principles. What are the core principles that will you, you will use to guide your decisions on city council, and why should we believe you're the candidate that will stick with your convictions? Yeah, great question. I am a conservative Republican, a limited government, free market, tough on national security, strong on public safety Republican. I'm endorsed by Congressman John Rutherford. I'm endorsed by State Senator Aaron Bean. I'm endorsed by State Representative Wyman Duggan. And those are the principles that will guide me. I'm not a politician. I never have been. I'm 48. I've been a business person for the past 20 years of my life, and again, a naval officer before that. So I'm not about to bend to political will that goes against my principles, my core principles. In fact, I think my core principles will drive pretty much how I view every aspect of city council. One of the things, because of the two minute limit, that I didn't get to say is I have two reasons I want to run for city council. The first was because of the critical juncture that we are have an experience in Jacksonville with the growth we're gonna experience and the leadership we need to guide us through that growth. But the second reason is our nation is also at a critical juncture. You know, local government matters. So socialism is perpetuated by the squad in DC through infrastructure bills and trillion dollar spending bills. Here, it comes through increases to property taxes and other wealth redistribution policies. We're, people like John Rutherford are fighting in D.C. to hold back socialism and hold the barbarians at the gates up there. We need people locally to do the same down here. You know, we have a presidential administration that's weak on defense. And what do we see from that? We see China making fun of them at the climate accords. We see a, a botched Afghanistan withdrawal. We're probably going to see um, Taiwan uh, taken over by the Chinese. We're certainly seeing overflight um, by the Chinese in Taiwan. How that manifests itself locally is under-resourcing our, our military, under-resourcing our veterans. We gotta stop it in DC, we gotta stop it locally. Absolutely agree with what Nick's saying about uh, limited government and uh, being good fiduciaries is the is the starting point, I believe, with city council. It's one of the things I think that uh, city government in general is missing is the understanding that you're taking care of other people's interests, their safety and their money and uh, the things that they identify with. Most of us identify as Jacksonvillians. Or we like this city and we want to identify with it. And we need a representative government that takes care of the constituency. Um, I don't have the list of endorsements of groups that Nick does. I, I do have Don Redman and Keisha Keene and Teresa Russell, so I've got that. I think that, uh, that we, we do need to, uh, we need to pay attention to the individual decisions that we make. I gotta tell you that I answer first to my God first and that every decision that I make is going through that filter first. And then the, the second one is um, are we answering to the people of Jacksonville versus my better interest or uh, my own, uh, call it selfishness if you will. Because one of the things I'm seeing with our city government, even from our Republicans, is when they're taking care of their own uh, self-interest for actual dollars and cents or for uh, power versus taking care of us, you. Okay, the next two minute question, and howdy, you'll be first, okay? There are neighborhoods of this said city that are in need of revitalization and have been for many years. At the same time, Jacksonville continues to grow. What should be done to balance the impact of this growth and development with the interests and economics of our existing residents and neighborhoods, new construction versus, re versus revitalization of older neighborhoods? I, I don't think that you can uh, you can't you can't run a city like Jacksonville. Right? You can't even run a town if you're not taking care of all those components, all of those neighborhoods, and in both of those ways, revitalization and with new growth as well. Uh, we need we need all of those things. So we it's not a one particular part of the city we need to work on. We need to we need to make sure that we know what we're doing, which parts of the cities uh, that that we potholes. 
driving through Springfield, giving one of my employees the, a ride home the other day. Go through Springfield, they have barrels in the middle of the road because of potholes. Well, we all know that when you get bad snowfall, those things happen, right? Wait. Okay, so we need to fix those roads. There's no excuse for that. It's all representative of Jacksonville. You know, when the watershed, when we get those deluges in the summertime, and, and they're relentless, and yet in some neighborhoods they just sit in, in basically in bowls in those neighborhoods, we need those fixed. Um, trash and recycling. Anybody ever have that kind of an issue? Uh, the limited, that we have limited power at, uh, in the city council once you have the problem. So the big key is, where are you targeting the money? What are you uh, saying that as a, as a government you want to focus in on? And what does the contract say? So when you're signing a contract for, uh, for that trash and for that recycle, what does it say? And what happens if a pandemic hits? Okay, maybe we don't know that. But what happens if you don't execute what you say you're going to do, Mr. Trash Company? Because uh, I'll tell you what, as a businessman, uh, hey, I love you, but if you're not executing your part of the, of the contract, we got to take action on you. Whatever provisions are in there, we got to do that quick. And then the second thing that we do get to do is we get to put that pressure on the mayor's office who has control over those things to say, hey, we signed this, you said it's what we needed to do and it's not getting done, so if it isn't the trash company, it must be you. And then wait to see what it says. <laughs> From the year 2000 to the year 2010 census, we gained 80,000 residents. From 2010 to 2020, we gained 130,000 residents. We're almost at a million. In fact, in the 2020 census, we're at 995,000. By now, we're at a million. If you talk to developers, they say that the demand for housing is gonna outstrip supply for the next 10 years. So, Ryman, your question is very pertinent, very timely, because how do we grow strategically and at the same time fix up some of our neighborhoods that have been left behind. So I'm a limited government Republican and a fiscal conservative, but as a devotee of Milton Friedman also, I know there are some times, very limited times, where the government does have to step in and do some things about um, infrastructure. And one of the things that we've done in the current budget is support getting some of the neighborhoods we've left behind in the northwest side. And that includes taking um, uh, folks off septic tanks and putting them on city sewers. That includes fixing, fixing uh, sidewalks and potholes and, and roads. Um, and we're seeing development like this beautiful school go up in the northwest side. So there are certain things we need to do to rectify issues that as a city we've um, really um, not done well in the last 20 years. All that said, moving forward with development, we need to be strategic about it. There are some amazing things we have about our city that sets us apart, and I know so from having represented businesses that want to move to Jacksonville compared to other cities in, in the neighboring area in the southeast, and that's our river, our ocean, our amazing quality of life. So as we grow strategically, we can't destroy that in neighborhoods like Mandarin and Beaches and Ortega. We need to maintain that beautiful quality of life, but also grow strategically with infill and new growth in some of the areas that were blessed, the, the land that we have to do so. So it's gonna be a real critical time in the next 10 years, and leadership at city council is gonna be important as we monitor that growth. Okay, Nick, you'll be first this time. Uh, the next two minute question. To tag along with your comments of the previous question, what are your thoughts on improving city services such as garbage pickup? Oh yeah, that's a catastrophe. Absolute catastrophe. And I know um, a lot of it comes down to just shortage of employees at the, by the haulers. And, and we as a city need to be doing everything we can to incentivize those haulers to, to accelerate the garbage pickup and the recycling. Um, if, if of one, between the three things, garbage, uh, uh, yard waste, and recycling, if we had to sacrifice one, the one that we had to do is recycling, but that means that as citizens, we're paying for a service we're not getting. And so I would want to look at getting a rebate or a credit for folks because we've temporarily suspended recycling, but we shouldn't have to be in that position in the first place. There's other systemic issues we have with limited landfills, and we need to address that in the long term. But for right now, we should be doing everything we can, everything we can to make sure we're meeting basic city services and be picking up our recycling and picking up, picking up our yard waste and our garbage on time. And if that means incentivizing, again, haulers and their employees um, to accelerate their work or accelerate hiring, then that's what we need to do. 
Okay, so I already got my lead into my argument about trash. How are you doing that? But I think that when somebody doesn't execute their part of the contract, there may be some unforeseen circumstances. I know that my businesses suffered from the whole staffing issue tremendously, and it was sudden and actually kind of unexpected. We thought we were kind of through the pandemic, and all of a sudden, now I, I've got no employees. They don't want to work, or they can't work. Most of them, it was they didn't want to work. They just abdicated. So things happen, and I understand that, but when you have a contract, I have no problem with executing the provisions of the contract. Also, jumping all over it. That's what we did in our stores. And so we were hiring people. Were we hiring people that already embodied the culture that we needed at, with our restaurants? No, we weren't able to get those. So then it started being, well, let's go one step. Okay, let's go two. Okay, let's just hire somebody with a heartbeat. Uh, you know, you kind of go there. And then you also look at your, your upper staff. I'm working a lot harder now. I'm doing a lot more dishes, and so is my partner. Because you do what you got to do. And sometimes you might have to take that VP and he might be driving a truck. So that's a good example for the uh, company and it makes it happen. The real key is that we, it should have been, been happening. And personally, I get, I get suspicious when you have a contract and it's not executed to the full extent and you don't have remedy. I don't think any of us is going to get rich on a refund for the services we didn't receive. It's not that. It's that that company's gonna hate it so bad trying to write checks to people or trying to give credit to people that they'll take care of the problem. So you, you do acts like that because it gets them to actually pick up your trash. Because that's what you want. You don't want 14 bucks back. You want your trash picked up, yeah. right? So that's, what, that, that, that's the way that I think that we need to approach it. Now, just because I got some extra seconds left, I'll tell you, I'm a business owner, always been a business owner, not a political guy. I don't expect to run city government like a business. I don't think that works. But to use common sense principles to be able to get things done and to take action on them, I, I, a saying that I've always said, problems never go away, take action. Next two minute answer, Howdy, you're up first. Explain your position on city funding for private development. For example, Lot J and other similar development proposals for downtown and port areas. Uh, I'm glad that Lot J didn't pass. Um, I do think that the city government has a responsibility, like Nick was saying, to encourage uh, growth. The challenge that I think Jacksonville has had, at least in the 30 years I've been here, is how we've done it is piecemeal. We've thrown money at this project, thrown money at that project, I mean, we've got this, we've got a, a skyway. Okay, uh, downtown looks like it's developing better. Um, we're getting some development done, but there's not a unified effort. And you, what you end up having is you've got five zones around the city, five police zones around the city that are saying, uh, uh, do my area, I, I want money in my area. But there's not a unified effort to that. I think we need to be able to follow leadership that has a, a unified, I mean, bold new city of the south kind of rolls off your tongue great, but it's like, okay, but what is that? Can you define that? Uh, as opposed to something along the lines of uh, uh, being the gateway to Florida. One of the things that we've realized uh, in, in, in Jacksonville is we, we actually have a port. Do you know what they do at ports? They take freighters. They take some of that, that supply chain, and we can handle some of that, right? There are six of those deep water ports in, in Florida, one in Jacksonville. We need to devote our efforts in things like that that diversify us so that we're not completely dependent on the tourism and the whims of the people that actually you know, have money and property in Jacksonville. We need, to, we need to be able to take action and devote city money and taxpayer money and private money, mostly private money, to things that unify Jacksonville so we're all rowing in the same direction and we understand it. I agree with Howdy. Um, in fact, uh, I spent a year on the uh, city's charter revision commission. You know, the city every 10 years has to revisit its charter and it puts people on a board to revisit what elements we need to do. And there were three um, proposals out of that, two that kind of were discussed and tossed around the city council, one of which I was on and a big advocate of, and that's building a strategic plan for the city. You look at cities that have had strategic plans that look beyond just where we're gonna develop, but where we wanna be as a city. You know, what do we want to be known? Um, and, and having a strategic plan and a goal for the city will guide that strategic development. It will guide what businesses or developments we incentivize. 
And that's something that Indianapolis has done really well. It's something San Antonio has done really well. And you look at the downtown of Indianapolis um, and the fact that it attracts sports, that was in their strategic plan, was to be a, a fundamental city that always gets major sporting events coming through. And that, that revitalized their downtown, that fixed up a lot of their education system in that city. So there's things that we could be doing, particularly now in this really important inflection point for the city of Jacksonville, where we're gonna grow over the next 10 years. We need a unified strategic plan just like that. And there are roles for incentives, occasionally in development, um, and that means if there's a, an empty lot or a, like our waterfront, which is absolutely underutilized um, and could be beautiful, um, where we can incentivize developers to, to bring productive stuff there that would be aligned with where we want to be as a city. There's also a, a role of government occasionally to incentivize businesses to move down. And we do do that through um, targeted industries and certain incentives for workforce and, um, and tax rebates and things like that. That's really important for the city, particularly when we're competing against places like Savannah and Charlotte and others. And we need to keep doing some of that in a fiscally responsible way. Okay, Nick, you're up first for the next two minute answer. During the past year with COVID shutdowns and mandates, all businesses have been affected, many with experiencing severe loss of revenues and many more that have closed their doors. Also, city services and access was dramatically cut during this time. Where do you stand on government closures and mandates? Oh, let's talk mandates. Um, there's probably no word in the English language which puts more fear in me and causes what hair I don't have to raise on end. Um, <laughs> I'm pro-vaccine. I mean, um, it was right for me and my family because um, we're real close with my 80-year-old mother who lives nearby and I didn't want to get her sick. But I am absolutely anti-mandate. Mask or vaccine. Um, absolutely anti-mandate. There's probably nothing more un-American than telling someone they got to take an injection in their arm. Um, it's really a, a horrible course of development over the last year for us. Um, yeah, and it, 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 it's... I gotta tell you the one thing that really frustrated me today was the Biden administration using OSHA, and you heard about the first rules coming out today, to force businesses with employees of 100 or more to get the vaccine. I mean, if, if the administration could use OSHA to force businesses with 100 or more employees to get a vaccine, what else can they use OSHA to do? Um, you know, are we gonna move towards a command economy like they have in China? That scares the heck out of me. So mandates, is a word which frightens me right now. I, I think that the, the word mandates is a glamour term. Uh, it, it is uh, dictatorship. Um, does that say it simple enough? I, I don't agree with mandates. Um, when Teresa and I had the, uh, the uh, responsibility to decide whether or not we were going to get vaccinated, I told her I was going to. I went to Katrina after it happened. I got a whole bunch of shots before I went. I don't even know what I got. But I know that I went to Katrina and I, I didn't die at Katrina. So I was like, okay, I'll take the vaccine. And she's like, well, they don't know what's in it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't care. You know, she goes, but what if you die? I said, well, then I'll be a science experiment. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the other thing. When I was working with Paul Davis Restoration, I became an expert in personal protective equipment. And I got to tell you that the masks that we use, we're listening to the wrong people. We're listening to doctors who are supposed to keep people healthy and not make people healthy. Not They treat sick people. We need to be talking to industrial hygienists that keep people safe. And we need to listen to real science on it. Because when you have a mask, there's two things that happen. You breathe out and you breathe in. And it has to be measured both ways. And then it matters whether or not you have a cloth or you have a, a, a surgical mask or you have a NIOSH 95 or whatever it is. All that matters. So when a government starts saying, you have to wear a mask, it's like, well, what kind? Well, I don't care. You just need to wear a mask. I'm like, okay. Then they change it to so yeah. um, absolutely against the mandate, especially when it proves that the people are that are making those decisions that are unconstitutional. The people that are making those decisions aren't smart enough to run my government. How do you first up for the next two minute question? Too hot. Big business here has historically been well represented by the Jacks Chamber, but the economic engine of this country and of Jacksonville is small business. 
What needs to be done to further streamline and enhance the small business climate and interface with the city of Jacksonville? Uh, shop locally, absolutely. In fact, if you have a chance, go to Jump and Jack's House of Food. <laughs> um, I was grilled by the, uh, by the Chamber of Commerce, and I thought that the Chamber of Commerce was targeting businesses in Jacksonville, and that it was targeting increased business for us all. We actually host a Chamber of Commerce meeting at, uh, at Jump and Jack's in Manor. Uh, so I thought that's where we were headed to, but the first question that I was asked was, uh, was asked by somebody who uh, all they do, they run a, a nonprofit and they actually have a criminal record. And so I'm like, and, and I, I know them, and I'm like, okay, this is their Chamber of Commerce. I hated how that looked to Jacksonville. I hated how that made us look and how I look at the Chamber now. And it's like, that's not how we're going to grow Jacksonville. We're going to go grow Jacksonville with, you know, with Jumpin' Jacks and with every other restaurant that we all love. Um, we, we're going to grow up with that local electrician. We're going to grow it with, uh, you know, local business. Big business is great. They're, I love them. They're great employers, and they bring good money to us, and it's fantastic. They put us on the map, so I love them. But the way we're going to grow Jacksonville is to shop locally and to uh, promote the little guy that's out there. Springfield has shown success in being able to do that to different levels. That's the key to it. It's not just dumping money at it. It's you know shop locally. Try just if you have if you can visit a local business one time more than you did last year, do that. It doesn't mean you have to go there every day or every week, but hit it one more time and find out, and then let all your friends know how good they are um, or how bad they are. Right? I mean, we do that pretty good in Jackson. Have I made back the time when I was like over? I made that over. Uh, well, I agree with Shop Locally. For, for sure, that's a way to help small businesses in the area. Um, we, we do have small business assistance programs uh, with the city and um, help in working capital loans and, and um, small business startup loans, what have you. But really, one of the main ways to drive businesses for small business is to attract larger businesses. When you when you build downtown and Dun & Bradstreet, you know, builds downtown, jump and gas and benefit for sure. Um, you know, a, a business that I'm working with right now to potentially locate 200 jobs in Northwest uh, Jacksonville, a uh, marine and defense manufacturing business, will bring more business for local printers, marketers, um, electricians, uh, machinists. Um, so the, the more businesses that we attract, and again, we have what it takes here in Jacksonville to attract businesses. I mean, we're a the free state of Florida, um, a low-cost environment, a great quality of life, and a number of um, uh, really prevailing uh, geographical factors like at the corner of 95 and I-10 and a wonderful growing port that we need to further deepen to attract more logistics businesses. That's going to attract business down. We need to attract business down to create jobs for the million people that are moving down here. And in doing so, we're going to make it a better environment for small businesses. Oh, and by the way, well, since I got a little bit more time, um, the Jack Chamber did endorse me as well as um, <laughs> as, well as, as well as the uh, uh, Northeast Florida Builders Association and the, the Realtors. Thank you. I am. <laughs> okay, Nick, you're up first for the next two-minute question. The question of historic monuments came to a head last year when the mayor, after coordinating with the Northside Coalition and other left radical groups, removed the statue in Hemming Park in the dead of night. Now the mayor is asking the city council for funds to remove the monument to the women of, of the Southland. What is your position on the removal of monuments and why? Yeah, I don't often agree with James Carville, Clinton's old um, uh, political consultant, but he said something yesterday, which is great. This woke culture is BS, and I won't, you know, he said the real word. Um, this woke stuff is BS, and it's, it's causing divisive racial politics in our nation and in our community. Um, to me, the easiest way to repeat an ugly history is to erase an ugly history. So I don't believe we should be taking monuments down. Um, and, and I certainly don't believe in teaching critical race theory in our schools and further causing racial divisiveness. To me, that's absolutely one of the big threats to our culture, nationally, state, Locally. Okay, so I agree. 
especially your first statement, it's very cool. Good statement. Um, we shouldn't be spending $1.29 million to get rid of history. Um, not without really checking into it, really knowing what we're doing, versus a knee-jerk response, and then being able to spend, somebody being able to spend $1.29 million or recommend it on a knee-jerk response. N no, I mean, can we rename schools? Okay, we, we can do that if we get the community. I, I know that, that I, I'm not looking to, but I'm just saying you, you can if the whole community says, yeah, you know what, we need to do that. Okay, but let's not do it as a knee-jerk response. And here's the test. Take $1.29 million in a, in a, in a footlocker, in $20 bills, and go into that neighborhood and ask them, hey, uh, we've got $1.29 million. Would you like it or would you like me to take down this monument? Just as a test of whether or not it was a good way to spend the money, right? And then the overreaching thing is the history part of it. I know as far as my personal history, I've told a couple of people about this today. My personal history, direct lineage, goes back to the Massachusetts 54th and Robert Gould Shaw, who led them. And uh, he was the cousin of my great-great-grandfather. And I happen to have his ceremonial ivory-handled revolver they got when he, when he got out of uh, officer school. I have Robert Gould Shaw's ivory-handled revolver. What's going to happen in 20 years is somebody's going to say all war is bad and we need to get rid of all relics that have to do with anything that was war-oriented. I mean, that's where we're going to go to on it. So, uh, absolutely against the idea that I'm against knee-jerk uh, moves. I'm against knee-jerk spending of millions of taxpayer dollars to take care of the woke generation. Okay, Howdy, you're up first for the next two-minute question. And this is uh, rather lengthy, so stay with me. So to follow up with this issue, there's a growing movement from the Northside Coalition and related Black Lives Matter groups to push an agenda in the city that reflects critical race theory. This includes statements and allegations regarding institutional racism and white supremacy in Jacksonville. This movement, given legs by the man who previously held this open seat, Tommy Hazuri, who immediately upon his election as council president established a social justice committee. With the help of his good friend Matt Carlucci, the mayor, the sheriff, the sheriff, the state attorney, and other members of the council, both Democrat and Republican, they have worked to appease these efforts and to allow as aspects of critical race theory and Black Lives Matter to have a prominent voice in Jacksonville. Where do you stand on CRT? And do you believe Jacksonville has a problem with institutional racism? Explain your reasoning and what you will do about it. In two minutes. Okay. Um, it's a serious, it is a serious issue by, by virtue of just look at how much press it gets and how many people are talking about it, and then the advocacy that some people have on their side of the subject. So it's a serious issue. We can't just blow it off, even though, I, okay, I don't understand this. I, I grew up in Texas with a name like Howie, but I'm working on stuff, okay? I went from Kerrville High School, I was telling, I was telling somebody this morning at breakfast that their mascot was the antlers. It wasn't even the whole deer, it was just the, the antlers. So I went from that high school to prep school up in Massachusetts. And it was 1975 where they had forced busing. And I didn't understand it. In, in Texas, everybody got along. Hispanics were there, there uh, white people, there were African Americans, there was Asians, everybody just kind of, everybody went to the rodeo on Friday night, okay? But I go to Massachusetts and two guys from South Boston and from West Rock, Roxbury could not get along. I, I, I couldn't understand why. But what's the matter? You know, well, he's from West Roxbury. So? Well, he's, he's black. Exactly. Was that my answer? Did you guys hear that too? Or was that okay? Um, when, when the Black Lives Matter were protesting last year, last summer, I told my, all my employees of all three stores, we have a policy when it comes to CRT, Black Lives Matter, and all that. Here's our policy. Do you see those windows at the front of our store? We want every one of those people on the other side of those windows in here eating our food. That's our policy. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they believe. I want them eating our food and taking a break the next day. Right? So, there you go. There are racists in our country. There are racists in our institutions, but that doesn't mean that our institutions are racist. And that doesn't mean we live in a racist country. In fact, I would say our country, compared to many others, is far less racist. 
I mean, think about it. When do you think you're going to see a white guy elected president of China or on the Communist Politburo, you know, or Japan as prime minister? Um, you know, we have come far as a nation. You know, we, we have our hiccups from our past. But the joy about our nation is that we're probably one of the most post-racial nations there is in the country. And when we are not there, we recognize it and we improve it and we improve it and we improve it. That's the joy of America. You know, that's what I love about America. And what I hate about critical race theory and the BLM movement is, again, the racial divisiveness that it causes. And I want to talk about something here because regardless of who wins and what's likely to happen in this December 7 election is either Howdy or I will progress into the runoff, likely against a uh, woman, a Democrat, defunder, BLM supporter named Tracy Paulson. And I want to read a Facebook post, two of them, from Tracy, and I'll watch that slide to make sure I can get them in so you might see me speed up my reading. But Tracy wrote on June 1, 2020, not too long after the uh, uh, horrific George Floyd incident, this is for my white family and Facebook friends. If you want to understand why all lives matter is problematic, I urge you to join me in examining our whiteness, our unearned privilege, and how white supremacy is an intentional system that is solely for our benefit. This isn't about blame or shame, it's about reality. I invite you to call me to talk further if you are interested. Now another one, just two days later. To my white moms, this post is why Black Lives Matter and why we, as white moms, never had to worry about it. And we are moms. Please reach out to me if you feel shame and don't know what to do. I don't know what to do either, but I'm trying to learn, listen, and learn some more. We have, potentially, a defunder BLM supporter that Howdy or I are going to run against. And that's why it's so important that we get as many Republicans out for this election as we can. Okay, Nick, you're up first for the next two-minute question. How will you overcome the political pressures to support certain agendas with the possibility of losing future funding for a project or organization you support? Also, are you affiliated with any organization that receives funding from the COJ? I will always do what's right. I will always make a decision to do what's right. And right now, I am executive director of the Firewatch, and inadvertently, it has received funding from the COJ because the Firewatch was created by the five counties in Northeast Florida, Baker, Clay, Duval, Nassau, and St. John's. Together, they created an interlocal, signed an interlocal agreement creating that entity, and each one of those counties gave seed funding to that organization. Um, so at one point, the city council voted to get into that interlocal agreement, to join with the other four counties to put together uh, veteran suicide prevention programs, and then also the city council voted to do seed funding to that entity. Um, so yeah, I have been affiliated with that. So what that means is if I continue in that role and I'm on city council, I support Councilman Rory Diamond's proposal that we just do an extra level of scrutiny for nonprofits or for for profits that may employ city council members. That's absolutely the right thing to do. And in any event, during council, we have three readings of any budget amendment. And so there's three times that it's presented to the public um, in order to provide scrutiny of that. And we also have where council members recuse themselves from a vote. Um, so is there a situation where in the future, if I'm on council, there's an opportunity for the city to fund the organization, which I'm currently serving as executive director? Yeah, small amounts, but most of our funding is going to come from foundations and state funding and potentially a, a, a lot of private funding. So I just will always be transparent. Um, I don't think, non, strangely, nonprofit has become a, a bad word. Well, what about all the attorneys who've been on city council who work for for-profit firms, you know? That doesn't mean they've done anything untoward as long as they're being transparent and their funding is getting analyzed and they're accusing themselves when the time is right. Uh, okay, so uh, how am I gonna withstand the pressure, uh, the political pressure? because of withholding funding for a project that I, what, that I want? Is that basically what the question is? Um, I think our, the second part about it. Y okay, um, I, I think I told you, I grew up in Texas with a name like Howdy. I don't, I don't, care, what you, I don't care what you threaten me with. Um, I mean, if you threaten me, it says everything about you and I'll know for the next vote how you're gonna move on that. And as soon as I can eliminate um, that, uh, that that fear, I mean, it's like Stockholm Central. You cave to that once, where you cave to that power, you're gonna cave every other time to that power. You establish yourself as, no, I'm a man of principle. 
I'm doing this for the city of Jacksonville, and my project's my project. You should vote for my project just because it's good. You shouldn't vote for it because I'm voting for yours. So uh, that's how I feel about that that pressure. And I just don't I don't cave in that method. I understand that there's politics to be done, there's negotiation, and I'm a negotiating guy. But let's do it on the up and up. Uh, on the other thing about taking money from the city, closest thing indirectly is the rent that we pay on our downtown store is uh, sometimes discounted unless our business is through the roof. It's sometimes discounted because uh, we're taking care of a provision in the lease that FSCJ has. We're subleasing from them. It takes care of a provision they have that they have to have a, ca a cafe in that, uh, uh, in that location. And we're there, so they give us a little bit of a, of a discount because of that. But we pay a percentage rent. So if our sales are doing really well, we pay more rent than they would have paid for. So, uh, Okay, uh, time manager, now we're gonna go to the one minute lightning round. Okay, ready? All right, so, uh, how do you go first? Here we go. What is your stand on the Second Amendment in any attempt to place restrictions on it within the city? I can't do it. It, it shall be unabridged. <laughs> Second Amendment to me is an unalienable, how do you say that, unalienable right. You can't take it away. I don't want any infringement on our Second Amendment or our rights of bearers. Okay, Nick, you're up first. One minute. Will you vote for only a Republican for council president? Why or why not? Absolutely. Oh, why? Because a Republican is going to share my same political philosophies and principles, and that's what we need in council president. It's an important position. My turn. Was that a full minute? Uh, <laughs> yes, I only want to vote for a Republican. I get scared by the current list of Republicans that could be in that office. I'm scared by that list. So I tell you, I will vote for that Republican, and he's going to get an earful a lot. You guess it. How do you have first? Will you vote to raise any taxes or fees? Explain. No, we've already raised enough taxes. And wait a minute, stop clapping. Stop clapping. I love you, can stop clapping. Uh, but at the same time, we feel like we can give away millions of dollars to move uh, monuments. We feel like we can give away $800,000 that is not competed for. So we've all, all of a sudden we got all this money that we needed to charge extra taxes for. So I'm definitely, from a business standpoint, you have to spend money, you've got to find out where it's coming from. So some, you're spending it too much over here if you've got it over here. And don't try to tell me that, that property taxes haven't gone up, even though the military hadn't gone up. When you're valuing properties, have you seen what your properties are worth now? Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Hey, I have more taxes, please. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Great point. In fact, uh, no, um, I would look to reduce taxes. And to Howdy's point, yeah. As we, as we grow and as we develop, we can actually look at reducing the military and probably still have a higher windfall in our tax base. Um, and as well, when we launch things like uh, six cent sales tax, um, I don't know why we had to go all six cents. Why couldn't we go two or three cents based on the projects that we wanted? Um, and why couldn't we look at other projects to reduce in order to support that? So we need to look at reducing before we increase at all times. Okay, Nick. Nick, you want to go first there on this one? So, what's your stance on privatization of JEA? Yeah, no, I think that ship has sailed. Um, so, JEA is a, is a wonderful um, uh, organization for us. I think we're happy where it is now. Um, all that said, um, I wanted to see, uh, I want to see it run more productively, more efficiently. Um, I think there's a new leadership team. I, I like what they're doing, except for the fact that they're about to increase rates, but I think they had to do that based on some of the decisions that were made before them and the catastrophe that occurred over previous years. Um, so I have faith in that management um, team, and I hope over time they start to, to get more efficient so we can see a, a reduction now on our rates instead of um, you know what we're about to see in the short term, an increase. That was a debacle. JEA was a debacle. Never should have been done. It never should have been considered. Privatization is a business move that is not a bad I mean, you, you should consider it. But for the reasons that it was considered, and then the ways that it was going to be carried out were corrupt and outright work. And uh, I really hope this is a good grand jury and a good prosecuting attorney. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out.
All right, you're up next. What will you do to encourage more citizen involvement in Jacksonville City Council? More citizen involvement. You mean numbers of visits that Blake Harper has to make? Uh, or, um, you know what? We just need to be approachable. It's really um, not a hard thing to get the citizen involvement if you involve yourself with them. If you're cutting their hair and you're talking to the guy about city council men, uh, issues and you're saying, hey, you should come down and talk to us. Or what else can I do for you? If you're doing that, those kind of things, if you're serving on food at Jumpin' Jack's House of Food at 20, <laughs> if you're doing that and you're talking to people, get them in the, get them in there. And it's a conversation. We don't need to be adversarial. We need to talk to people, right? We need to encourage that conversation. One of the joys of um, potentially being an at-large uh, city council person is that you've got a little bit more time on your hands and you can handle larger citywide issues. And I think as an at-large candidate, you need to be having a lot of town halls, get the pulse of what's going on around the entire Duval County. Um, also, I would one of the things I would look to be doing if I was an at-large uh, city council member would be trying to forward that strategic plan that I talked about. And that would take uh, a lot of uh, community involvement in and public hearings uh, in order to get really gauge where the community sees the city needs to be in 10 years as we grow. So in that way, that's how I would foster increased community involvement. Okay, that now ends our one minute lightning round. So the Liberty Caucus, uh, the Republican Liberty Caucus has a candidate liberty compact. And I'm gonna read this to you and then you can either agree to the compact or say no. Uh, this is what you're agreeing to. I pledge to the citizens of this city that as their elected representative, I will work to restore liberty, not restrict it, shrink government, not expand it, reduce taxes, not raise them, abolish programs, not create them, promote the freedom and independence of citizens, not the interference of government in their lives, and observe the limited, and observe the limited, Okay. And observe the limited, enumerated powers of our state and federal constitutions and city charter, not ignore them. Will you agree to this compact, Nick? Yes, I agree. Will you agree to this compact, Howdy? Yes. Okay. So this uh, next question is another two minute question. Okay. Nick, we're going to start with you. With two Republicans and two Democrats in this race, the likely outcome is that one of you will proceed to a runoff election in February against Democrat Tracy Polson. Uh, Mrs. Polson is experienced politically. Mrs. Polson is experienced politically, can raise money, and can even self-finance. What makes you the best candidate to proceed to beat Tracy Polson in that runoff? Me? Go ahead, we'll switch it up. Sure. Well, who do you want to go? Nick, go. All right. I think I'm the best candidate because I am ready to run now. I'm ready to take her on, and I've been preparing to take her on. I'm, a, again, a businessman, um, a veteran. I'm a family man raising my kids here, a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old. Um, right now, if you look at the city council, one of 19 is a veteran. That's 5% of the city council. If you look at Duval County, 12% of the county are veterans, and 25% have some military affiliation, military members, family members, veteran. So you put me on right now during a critical time when we're talking a lot about veterans and military issues, when the Republican base is strong and ready to come out and, and get behind somebody. Um, you automatically double our veteran representation on the board. Um, there's another reason why I think I will be the best candidate to beat Tracy Paulson, and that's because she's already kind of putting out mailers to attack me. Um, so I think she fears um, running against me in the runoff. Uh, and I'm really, really happy with <laughs> the flyer she's put out. I have a copy here, if anyone wants to see it. It says, Trump Republican Nick Howland will obey Lenny Curry and Ron DeSantis. Funded by pay to play special interests, um, focused on donor handouts, and he's got, they got pictures of Trump and DeSantis right on here. So, you know, if you need to associate me with them, then so be it. Thanks for the mailer, Tracy. Uh, I think I'd be the best one to take on Tracy because that's great. If I'm under her radar screen, that's great. Um, uh, Tracy uh, is uh, some of the, honestly, politically, is a nice lady, probably a good doctor. Um, 
but is some of the worst kind of politician we can have in Jacksonville, which is uh, being a politician and governing based on an imagination as opposed to what needs to happen. I did, uh, I was actually in a forum one-on-one -on -one against Tracy Paulson, and the organizers of that forum said, uh, they came to the restaurant the next day and they said, hey, we just want to compliment you. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, because Tracy came off as being polished, but she was just doing platitudes. She was using words and phrases that she's been told to say. And so she was just given that. You came across as genuine, like you actually want to serve somebody. And I said, I do. Can I count on your vote? <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think that, that that's the thing. So I'm, I'm the best one to go against her because she's wrong, and true conservative Republican principles are correct. Okay, this will now move us into the candidate close, and um, Howdy, you get to go first, and Nick, you will finish up. When I watched that, uh, when I watched that. City Hall meeting, uh, the City Council meeting, my first one, I watched the whole thing, it was exciting. You ever watched one of those meetings? Watched the whole meeting, and the cool part is, is that one of the things that I did, I gotta stand up, I just can't sit down anymore. One of the things that I did for Paul Davis Restoration was I would actually give ethics classes, five hour ethics classes in Florida, five hours of ethics. <laughs> But ethics mean a lot to me. So when I watched that meeting, a couple things happened early on. A city councilman stood up and he said, I need to abstain from a vote. And I'm like, abstaining? That is awesome, that's ethical. And he said, because I, there's a vote, there might be a conflict of interest, so I need to abstain from that vote. And a few minutes later, another city councilman got up and did the same thing, and I'm like, tears in my eyes from this great ethics that they're all showing. I love it when a judge goes, you know what, I'm gonna recuse myself because I might have a conflict of interest. As a city councilman, you have got to be above reproach. I really believe that. But then here's what I saw. I was about to nod off three minutes before the meeting was going to close, and then all of a sudden there was this flurry of votes. $800,000 got approved for nonprofits. I'm like, what just happened? And it's like, well, all the guys that said that they, did, that they were abstaining from votes just got all their money anyway. Really? That did, something ethically stinks here. And one of the things that is common practice in, in our city government is you can pay one guy, you can fund one guy, and then that money finds its way to the other guy. So, whether it's an inspector general move, whether it's an FBI move, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, I think questions have to be asked. And in the absence of, uh, in the absence of somebody uh, actually investigating that kind of thing, I am the guy that's going to ask the questions. Where's that money going to go to? What are you going to do with that money? Because you're going to end up getting it. How much are you going to get? Okay, my constituents, which at an at-large seat is everybody, are going to know where that money's coming from, going to, and who's going to actually get it. All right, I had to confirm with Ryman that this is closing statements. We have a real critical time in Jacksonville's history. We need strong leadership in our city government. We've not seen it the last 10 years. We need to see it the next 10 years. So we moved down here, my wife and I, 15 years ago with a boy who was barely one. Our oldest is 15 now. We had another one here, he's 13. We've raised our kids here. We love Jacksonville. We never want to leave. And the reason that I want to run for city council besides, or that I want to be on city council, besides the two that I laid out, Jacksonville's at a critical juncture and our nation's at a critical juncture, is because if we can fix these issues and if we can position Jacksonville well for the next 10 years while we encounter amazing growth, if we can bring safer streets, if we can bring jobs for all the people relocating here, if we can hold socialism at bay, keep our low cost um, of living, our low tax environment, then maybe my 15 year old, 10 years hence, when he's looking to start a family, or when he's looking to start a career, we'll choose Jacksonville. Not Charlotte, not Nashville, not Orlando, not Washington, D.C., but Jacksonville. That's really what my wife and I want to do. I want to create, or help create, or play a role in helping create the Jacksonville of 10 years from now. And now's the time to start exhibiting leadership to do that. So vote Nick Howland. Thank you.
So I want to thank both candidates for being here this evening and being honest. And I want to thank you folks in the crowd here. And how about another round of applause for yourself and for the candidates. Please. And you two feel free to have lunch and call it a mandate, okay? <laughs> All right, so now we're going to have some, uh, some uh, a moment of honesty here. So there's the brains of the Liberty Caucus, and there's the pretty face. And since I'm the pretty face, I'm going to step away and give you the brains. Here we go. <laughs> All right, I just wanted to thank you all again for being here. And again, please, um, thank you for these candidates. These guys, I gotta tell you, I don't care who you've chosen, I don't care who you're thinking about, I don't care who your candidate is, both of these gentlemen are good men, and both of these gentlemen have stepped up to put themselves in the public eye, take a lot of flack, spend a whole lot of hours away from business and family to, to vie for this seat, to do something, to accomplish something for all of us, and both of them deserve a huge round of applause for that. Uh, a quick thanks to Maciel Greppi, who is our, our photographer and videographer this evening. Thank you so much for doing everything that you're doing. When that video gets out, again, please share it with everyone so that they have the opportunity to also hear these great candidates. And um, anybody who's interested in the Liberty Caucus, we have membership available at the, at the front desk. And we also, for those of you who want to get away for a moment, politics seems to be like constantly around us, but we're doing something a little different Saturday night. We have a block of tickets for opening night at the Iceman Hockey Game. It's a really, 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 really good special deal with all kinds of extras included. And if you're interested in possibly joining us, we still have a few tickets left, and they can get you information about that also at the registration desk. Thank you all very, very, very much for being here, and have an amazing evening. Take good care.